Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be looking at Rocky Linux 8.5. Yeah, it's been a while. But we're going to take a look at 8.5 right after this. So Rocky Linux uh, 8.5 came out. <laughs> they, I think they had planned to actually have this come out pretty close to the date that Red Hat released uh, their version of RHEL 8.5. And oddly enough, CentOS has also released a version of 8.5 as well, which seems kind of strange since there's only about a month left. But I mean, they, they are trying to keep it up to date, so I guess that's good. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. So let's let's dive in and talk about this a little bit. So Rocky Linux 8.5 was released on November the 15th of 2021. Now, RHEL released their version on, I think it was November the 9th. So yeah, so it wasn't very long before, the, before they actually released uh, Rocky Linux. And there's a reason for the delay. They would have done it sooner, but there's a reason for the delay. And we'll talk about that, a good reason. So... There are, as we had talked about last time, there are three images that you can download from their website. There's the boot image, and that's used to install the OS from another source, say an HTTP-based uh, repo, for example. There's also minimal, so if you just want the basics of getting up and running, and then you will build up the rest of the packages that you need, that's a good place to start, particularly if it's an Edge or a Cloud build. You might want to be considering that. There's also the DVD, which is a full install of the base OS and application uh, uh, package repos as well. So I'm not saying it's a full install of every package in there. It isn't, but uh, it is a the most common way to install Rocky Linux, particularly if you're using this for development or you're using it for a test system. Uh, Rocky Linux functions like CentOS, although... I think it's probably more correct to say it functions more like Red Hat Linux. Uh, that is, they have, well, we'll talk about it, but they, to say that it's bug for bug compatible with Red Hat Linux, maybe, because they are fixing things that Red Hat has not yet. So, uh, and I'll show you an example of that. So Rocky Linux 8.5 is a production ready distribution. I think the last time I looked at 8.3, it was still kind of in a release candidate stage. But that is no longer true. I mean, they're, they are rolling these out. They've had an 8.4. I did not review that. But, um, yeah, so this this particular version of Rocky Linux, is the end of life for it, is planned May 31st, 2029. So it has a pretty long support window. Also, uh, because of some, I don't know if there's, because of specific changes or whether this has always been true, typically... Most of the server-based Linuxes have have what the uh, U.S. Export Administration con considers as as sensitive technologies in them, and so this is on the restricted list. So, if your country is on the restricted list by the U.S. Export Administration or EAR, then yeah, you won't be able to download it. Sorry, um, that that is a that is always an issue that even I had to deal with when I was working in the real world, but. Uh, even with our stuff. Um, so Rocky Linux 8.5 currently supports the base and application stream repos. The base OS contains the basic required set of functionality, and then the application introduces the concept of multiple versions of user, user space uh, components. Uh, and those are delivered, as we had said last time, more frequently than the base OS, of course, because base OS, you have you have concerns over, I have gone through security compliance testing. Maybe I have some other types of internal compliance testing I have to do. And some modification of the base OS could throw your system out of compliance and force you to into a long, lengthy wait to get the system back into compliance so that, it, you know, that it's approved to be run in production. <clears throat> Last time we talked about the install options. We'll look at those again today. When we're installing this, I plan to do a demo, but the, there are some basic ones like server with GUI. Now, in the past, I have always said not a good idea to install server with GUIs, but there are some good reasons to look at it now. And again, we'll talk about that. There's also the basic server, which is a text-driven uh, server. 
And then, of course, you have the uh, Rocky Linux workstation, which is similar to RHEL's workstation. There's a lot of other features and, and uh, configurations you can use. Some of the big things that have happened is the Linux kernel has been updated. I mean, it's always been 418, but the patch level now is 348. Uh, and, of course, to say that that's a 418 kernel, that's probably not really fair to say because it really contains a lot of backports and fixes that are coming off of newer kernels. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, I wouldn't call this 418 anymore, but we have to do that because uh, because that's that's the way that we track things, uh, you know, uh, from the base kernel. Just re just remember that and if you're looking at the 418 capabilities, you're going to find additional features and driver support that's in 418, 384, 348 than you would in a stock 4.18 kernel. So the last change was October the 10th in 2021, and I think they added a bunch of uh, a bunch of stuff for containers in that patch. Uh, there was some fixes and there were some enhancements that were done with it. So, uh, but Rocky Linux 8.5 now supports secure boot. And that was the reason for the delay. Uh, they had just gotten ready to uh, release. I think they had planned to release on the 12th. I don't know the exact date, but they had planned to release it the next day, they said. So, and Microsoft they had come back with a countersign secure boot because they have to do that in order for, uh, you to have the keys that you need in your server in order to use Secure Boot to boot them. So uh, that was done on, at the evening of November the 11th. And so they thought that was uh, a particularly monumentous event. And it was critical enough that they held off on the release until that was in. So that was the reason for the delay. But their releases are coming out a whole lot faster than they did back in the beginning. Well, of course, you know, they have a, there's a, out in the forum, Skip, one of the engineers, has a one and two part engineering build design on how they do their uh, builds. So if you're interested in learning more about how Rocky Linux uh, pulls repositories, does the necessary updates and so forth, you can look at how they do that. He fully died. I think he's up to part two. I don't know if he has planned additional parts, but it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting read and it's on his blog and there's links to it. In the, in the forums for Rocky Linux. So uh, I'll, I'll put some links in below so that if you're interested in that, you can go and check it out. Uh, but the one thing is there, I'm, according to the documentation, I don't know if this has changed, but according to the documentation for Rocky in the GitHub repository for the secure shim, it talks about some post steps that are necessary to actually get the keys to install. And uh, they indicate in that, in the... Uh, uh, secure shim uh, get uh, that you need to do that once Rocky Linux has been uh, has been installed so you might want to look at that and and uh, I could be wrong about it if somebody from Rocky Linux is watching this video would please correct me uh, as to what's happened I'm, I go by what I can find and what I can read uh, that's easily available so I don't know if that is the latest news so However, uh, the installer for Rocky Linux now permits root password and user account creation. That was true in 8.3 as well. Uh, I have seen that also in RHEL and also in Fedora. So, yeah, you can now do that. <clears throat> uh, the This number of technologies previews, that hasn't changed since 8.3. And, of course, that's tied to the 8.0 release. These are all the ones that are there. I'm not going to, uh, now it says Podman containers are a technology preview. That's no longer true. So as you will see as we get going through this, but the rest of them, as far as I know, still are. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> jump right into it. There's container Podman 8 are now GA. So with as of uh, 8.5, so they now have verified container images by default. Uh, there's also native overlay FS as the root container user. And the, and the fourth bullet that should be on here, that's really in the main part here is it's a lot easier to manage and deploy containers. They have actually under cockpit, they have actually added support for managing, installing and downloading containers off of, uh, the Podman uh, repos. So yeah, you can now find those and there are. Uh, some other things that are in there as well. For example, 
uh, in the cockpit displays now, you have enhanced uh, performance metrics that you can enable. They're not enabled by default. You have to run some services and then wait for it to collect. I'll show you that today. I have had mine on, uh, have had an install up and running and it's collecting. So yeah, we'll take a look at that. And there are some Ansible modules. I have not played with that yet uh, for hardware management, but I did notice that there was quite a bit more that's in the cockpit um, web, what they call a web console now, but it's still cockpit uh, to me. Um, there's still, a lot, there is a lot more features in there and a lot less bugs. I remember the first time I tried to use it, I think it was a couple of years ago. It, it didn't seem to work all that great, but they have definitely fixed it. It is definitely working very well. So at least for the small test that I ran. Uh, there's also system roles for VPN and POSFIX. And uh, the big one is you can now do kernel live patching and that's available. Uh, and within, so they'll do live patches, but if it's a major kernel release, like going from 4.18 to 4.19, for example, or whatever, uh, that would be done within six months after a new kernel build, which is pretty fast considering uh, that's a lot faster than we normally ha have done kernel patching in the past. So uh, yeah, uh, the other thing is that you can enable and manage that with the uh, cockpit web console now. So I'll show you that today as well, hopefully. But there's uh, quite a few new security enhancements in this. There's an enhanced system security services daemon, or SSSD. However, I noticed uh, a couple of things when I was playing around with it that the service crashed on me when I was inside a web console. It came right back up, but I'm not sure what was going on there. There's also network uh, time security, NTS for network time protocols, and... Uh, so that secures and encrypts the uh, time-based protocol. Remember, none of the standard Linux services have ever been encrypted in the past. So these, it's good to see uh, a lot of these things happening now. I'll, also, along with that, our syslogd has been updated to include TLS support for the transport, uh, taking uh, the uh, encryption keys out of OpenSSL and using those for our syslog to transport log data across the network. So now we're now we're doing encryption in flight, so that's good. Uh, SCPA, SCAP, excuse, excuse me, SCAP Security Guide now contains some new profiles for the Australian Cybersecurity Center Information uh, Security Manual, or AC, ACSCISO. I don't know where governments come up with their acronyms. I mean, uh, I mean, the funny thing is when I was in, it was working with the government, we always came up with something that actually said something that it was sometimes funny, sometimes not, sometimes, uh, yeah. But uh, so uh, the Center for the Internet Security Profiles have been restructured. I think in the past they just had workstation and server, and now they have broken it down to workstation level one and two, server level one and two. So uh, I, I assume that the, I don't know exactly which one is tight, or I haven't played around with those yet, but I will. Uh, STIG, which is the, um, that is the profile that's used by the Department of Defense and other government agencies, and then that is compatible now with server GUI. So they, that, is, that is good because in the past that wasn't there, and so it wasn't checking uh, the GUI component, components of the server before. So, yeah. Um, there's also a new French National Security Agency high-level profile, and that is version 1.2 of the hardening is completed. So if you're if you're uh, required to comply to those, you now have uh, SCAP uh, uh, profiles that will support those. In networking, FileWare D now supports forwarding traffic between different interfaces within a zone. It also supports filtering traffic that's forwarded between zones. So. That's some nice new features that weren't there before. If you're a developer, uh, OpenJDK 17 is now supported. And of course there are versions beyond that. However, uh, you can also install, and there's some concerns of course, always with JDK and as far as security. So if that bothers you, you can install the OpenJDK in a universal base image container, a UVI. That'll prevent it from uh, gaining access to your system as a whole. Uh, also, .NET 6 is supported uh, in this release, and then Ruby 3.0, Node.js 16, PHP 7.4, Squid Force 15, MUT 2.07. Uh, 
The GCC tool set's been updated to 11. LLVM is 12.0.1, Rust 1.54, and Go 1.16.7. So pretty modern. Uh, that's not all that far off the latest builds of some of the other distros. So not that far. So I guess with that, I think we'll stop here and we'll do a demo. I have my VM set up, not a template. I'm, I will template this, I think. Um, so I'm ready to get started here. I have, as you can see... I have four gig of memory now. You can go higher, of course, if you want, but I usually like to start with that. Four cores, two uh, sockets, two cores, just the way I do things. I do have the BIOS set to default, which is a standard BIOS. Uh, I am using Spice for my display uh, in order to be able to get things a little faster. And then I allocated a 32 gig partition for the hard drive on a ZFS uh, file system, so which is installed inside of Proxmox, in case you were wondering. And there's my Anaconda screen. So this is pretty typical, even for uh, Fedora or uh, CentOS as well. So we'll go ahead and say it's English. It'll take a minute to switch. So there are some items here that need to be completed. So my keyboard is in, that's fine, but my time zone is not New York. So I'm gonna fix that. So we'll set it to Chicago. Uh, you can, if you want, to change your installation sources. You can change that if you wish. Software selection is where you get some choices here. So I can set up a, uh, a server with GUI, a server, a minimal install, which is basic functionality, a workstation, a custom operating system that I can then set up, or if I'm going to run a KVM host, I can set that up as well. So... I'm going to leave it on server with GUI this time. And then over here, you have some additional options you can choose if you want additional system tools to be installed along with it. So I'm not going to do anything different other than that. So we'll leave that. Uh, the next step is to select my destination. I'm going to let it default to an automatic configuration. Now I could, KDump is enabled, which is great. I'm going to enable the network as well and get an IP address for this, which is going to be 16, 116. Uh, if I have any security profiles, I can come in here and do it here. So uh, these, of course, are the SCAP security profiles that we just talked about. So there's level two, um, level one server, level two server, level one. And we should have workstation level one and level two if you want those. And of course, this is going to be uh, looking at various compliance items and let you know what needs to be changed. I have covered this in the past. I'll probably have to do an update for that. I'm not going to choose one right now. You can always add them later if you want. I am going to set up a root password because... Um, the you know if you do get a mount condition or some kind of problem on boot where it wants to drop you where it wants to drop you into uh, a shell if you don't have root enabled you won't be able to do that so so on servers I typically do that so we'll go ahead and do this I'm going to make myself the administrator I will, however, disable uh, root from from uh, remote access, so from SSH, so it can't be done that way. But passwords do not match. Well, let's try it again. Okay. Good, all good, and we're done. And we can go ahead and start. You probably remember in the past that. Uh, this used to just take off while you were doing the user settings. It doesn't do that anymore. I think that was raising some anxieties. So people were like, well, I got to hurry. I got to get this done before the install finish. But you have a few minutes to do this. So it wasn't a big deal to me. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to race the system to get finished with the install. So I will, I will hold it here and then I'll be back when it's done. It is 1817, as you can see on the screen there. So it, I didn't get it in time, so it was sitting there for a while, but it, it looks to me like it was about 10 minutes to do the install, so not a lot of time.
Okay, so now we need to accept the, this would be normally where Red Hat has their license key, but we don't need one for Rocky. But we still have the screen to get through just for compatibility's sake. And we're done. So now it should log me in and we can get started. Yeah, yeah, nope, <laughs> no. and that's good, and we're good to go. And then it'll come up with the keyboard shortcuts, all that stuff for GNOME. All right, so let me get this set up. And the other thing I probably should do is go into the settings, which are right here. And let's see. I think it's under devices. Yes. And we'll get this up a bit. There we go. That's the one. I, no, no, well, I guess that's all right. Yep. It'll still be on the screen anyway. Okay, so that's all I need to do there. I The next thing I need to do is, I'm gonna check my sudo and I'm gonna update the system at the same time. There's the app stream, there's the base, and there's extras. Okay, so next step. I don't have to do a pseudo for this. We'll just search for the EPL. This is different than Red Hat, of course, because Red Hat, you have to use their repos and not the public ones. So there's a little bit different repo that you have to enable. But on this one, you can... That should allow me to install HTOP, Glances, NeoFetch. It gets in the main, so it would it would pick that one up no matter what. So I need those for what I want to do today. And all right, we'll reboot it. There we go. So let's take a look at a few things that we always look at. So first, that patch was 2.1. It was compiled November the 15th. I, yeah, so that's a very recent patch um, to the uh, operating system. And let's see, what else do we want to know? We want to know how large, how much disk this is taking. And 5.2 gigs. So it's not, I mean, even though it has a GUI installed, I wouldn't consider that huge. Um, the other thing to do, and I see I still have my DVD mounted, so I should probably unmount that. But uh, let's see. I also want to do an HTOP. Let's see how much memory. It'll probably be a little under a gig, and it is. I have 111 tasks running, 276 threads. There's a little bit of load on the system, but there are some system processes that are running like Audit D, and that's by default. A lot of systems, Audit D is not even installed. So those are all security. I mean, that that's your uh, that allows you to stick in audit rules and then have it monitor the system. I don't know. Let's see if there are actually any audit rules in here. Minus L, I think it is. Yeah, 
no rules. Okay, so it's not, I don't know what it's monitoring. I don't have any rules in here yet, but we will. Um, the other thing to look at is glances. Oops. And 1.16 gig right here. And that's, of course, with the app cache. Um, you'll notice that there's a, a virtual BR here. So there must be some virtualization running on the system too. Otherwise, it wouldn't have created that. That, of course, is my main network connection. There's no traffic at the moment. Uh, yeah, it's showing a little bit more. 215 tasks, 174 threads. And the network is idle. So, yeah, nothing earth-shattering there. Let's see what NeoFetch shows. Now, the last time I ran this, it had the default login for Linux. It still does. Uh, yeah, they, they just, that package needs to be updated to include their logo, I would think. But let's see. Uh, it is showing 1,384 RPM packages installed. Now, don't compare this to Arch or to Debian. They do not package things up the same way. So... That has no bearing on how many applications are actually installed. The next thing is to go out to opt. This is off. Yeah, there we go. And we'll let this run too. Three oh seven still. Yeah. Let's see what we got here. Six point sixty two percent hardening index, two hundred and sixty nine tests. There will be some additional ones in here that aren't in most distros just because of it being a server. And saying that I need to reboot. And it found a promiscuous interface. Yeah, it's going to complain about that. It all looks normal. It all looks the same. Yeah. Not, yeah, it's not, I don't see anything in here that I wouldn't see on any other distro. So, yeah, I'm not, not too concerned about it. So, the next thing is uh, to look at See if it's running. It is not. So I'm just going to start it. I think there's a dependency you have to enable. So, and then we'll check the status on it. Okay, that looks good. I want to validate that my IP address hasn't changed, should still be 116. It is. Okay. So I'm going to go out to my local host here. This is not on VirtualBox, or excuse me, on Proxmox. This is my local system, and we will attempt to go to and if I remember right, it's 9090 is the port number for this. Yep, and Google's going to complain. All right. So I should be able to log in with, oops, not caps though. Well, maybe you can do caps, I don't know. I just wanted to take a look at this because uh, it has been a while since I have actually looked at, at this. So, ooh, this is, so I'm in limited access, which means that I do not have root privileges. So let's go ahead and do that. And it's asking me for my password again. And we'll authenticate, and then it should go to admin access. So right now we're on the dashboard, and it shows the health of the system is up to date. If there was any packages that needed updating, I believe they list here. CPU, it's no activity. Memory is about 12% or so. And then it shows some information here. I can get further hardware details here and look at all the things that are virtualized. <laughs> of course, if this were real hardware, it would probably print information about the real hardware. But since it's not, uh, let's look here at this. Okay, so 
uh, you can see the CPU and stuff here. I've got this turned on in another one, so I'll go over there and show you because it does take some time. I could turn this on now, but it does take some time for it to collect. So it won't be very meaningful unless, yeah, we're actually looking at something that's, that's, so here's my service list. Swap file, nothing been used there so far. Um, the disk shows me my how much space and then how much traffic is going in and out of my network. So then you have your log files here and you can specify a filter so I can look at all alerts. Can't find any, let's try another one. Critical, nothing. Warning. So now we see warnings being included in here as well. So if you you can basically filter this out. There's also you can put identifiers in here too. So as if you're trying to troubleshoot something, uh, you can do that. So and it, and it'll give you more information about each of the error messages itself. Uh, storage, I uh, can see how much is reading and writing. This is a nice. Yeah, and again, you have logs on the drives, too, that you can look at. It uh, looks like you can set up NFS mounts right here. So if I wanted to do that, I could. You can mount it read-only. You can also do custom mount options, and you just, I guess, fill it in. Okay. Um, networking. Firewall rules. Looks like you can edit them. There's two active zones, <clears throat> one for public, and then the live vert zone. So I could come in here. It's already, since I set that up, it automatically added it, or it may have been set up already. And then if I wanted to add services to it, I can. So I can come down through the service list and add that on, or I can just do a custom, which will allow me to just enter it longhand. Pretty nice. Unmanaged devices, view the network logs. <clears throat> this, I think I will actually start this. So I do want to show you this. This is quite different than it was last time. So you now, you now can, uh, I think you could do this before, but I'm not sure that this really worked. So at least I don't remember if it did or not. Let's look for Rocky, see if we can find one. Okay, we got one right there. Now, if I wanted to, I could make this, a, like if I was setting up a developer development container, I could set that up for myself. So let's see. Yeah, it shouldn't change the repo any. This is, should make it local to me. Let's go ahead and download it. I haven't tried this, so I, it might blow up, but we'll find out. It's pulling in the container. And there it is. And... <clears throat> Let's see if it gives me any information about where it's installed it. Not really. But it does say it's mine. And then I can start that container. And here you have some options. Like you can limit the memory. Access it with a terminal. I can also expose ports. So uh, my host port is over here. And then the optional port is over here. The container port. And also, I can have my volumes exposed as well. I'm just going to go ahead and run this just to see what it does. Wonderful. It always, they, every time, yeah, unless you give it a name, it's going to pick one at random, and some of them are pretty funny. So, yeah, it's running. It's running. And I should be able to look at the status of it. So I can restart it. I can stop it. This is pretty nice from where it was. So we'll go ahead and stop it. We'll do a clean stop on it. We don't want to blow it out of the water. And then let's go ahead and delete the container. I don't, I'm done with it. I don't want it anymore. Yep. Force and delete. Gone. So yeah. Uh, accounts. We can, since I, I can go in and edit accounts. Let's see what all we can do. Oh, nice. I can add uh, my keys. So one of the things that Cockpit allows you to do if you have multiple servers running it is you can log in 
you'll see here I'm logged into the local domain, but I can log into another host from the same session. So I can have all my hosts in here that I'm administrating, which is nice. It's a pretty good system, really. Um, so let's see. Let's get back out. And we'll go look at services next. This should be a list of all the services on the system. Let's say we want to filter this. All I want to see is running. I don't care about any of the ones that are not running. So yeah, there's all the services that are currently running. Then you have tools down here. So applications, if you want to customize what is actually installed. I could include, you know, I could put man, virtual machine management under here. Now that's KVM under this particular version of the OS. So this is not Proxmox. Not going to manage your Proxmox for you. Um, but I can manage storage pools. Diagnostic reports will collect information. So let's go ahead and create a report. Now realize that these are usually sensitive. Because, yeah, so don't just go throwing this across the internet without encrypting it. If you need to send it to somebody for, for help, <laughs> don't, don't do that. So, now this should, this should give me some options to download it to my local system. And then I can look at it, you know, maybe trim out the sensitive parts before I send it off to somebody else that I don't really want them to know, like private keys, for example. Should create, I think it creates a tar file. So let's go ahead and download it. Yeah, let's put it on my local system. So I can, I have some options I can then do with it. I can open it up in archive. I can extract it and look at it. I'm not going to do that here, but yeah. So if you need to have diagnostic information, you can do that now. And also, if you're a kernel developer, this, or if you're just having problems with your systems, you can, yeah, we can actually crash the system. And of course that's gonna cause a reboot because it does cause a kernel panic. So I'm not really gonna do that, but if you, it'll put these in the var directory. So I think it's crash under crash. So yeah, if you're look, looking for it afterward. My SC policies, I have two. And then if there was any software updates. Now, there's some things you can do here. <clears throat> I don't see. I may have to enable that. Let's see. Let's see what we got. Okay. Let's do that. I just want security updates. And we'll check every day at 6. That's good. Might want to do that once a week, might want, you know, it depends on what you need. Now, on the other system, I was seeing, maybe I'm just missing the application for it. Let's see. Uh, I don't see it. So, on the other system I was playing around with, I was able to set up kernel updates, kernel, um, so I'll go, I'll bring that up so that you can look at that, where we were actually doing uh, kernel patches. Now that's not showing up here. It might be that I did not enable it when I did the install, so yeah. Um, so that's, that's it for this. That's supposed to be in here. And then, oh, there's my SSH keys again, and it can log out. All right, so what I wanted to do was there was a couple of things that I had talked about uh, that I wanted to show you. And so I've gone over to the other machine uh, to bring up the, this, this has been collecting details for a while. So let me just show you. It's underneath uh, overview, and then you just simply go to view details and histories, and it'll show you this performance metrics tab about what's going on. And as it collects data, it begins to fill in these categories for CPU, memory, disk IO, and network. And then 
down here where I was running some benchmarking, you can see quite a bit of activity here. It was just a simple test um, to uh, put some activity into the system so that it was actually collecting something. And then you can continue to go back into later data if you have it, and uh, or excuse me, earlier data that if you want to. And uh, let's see, I don't think I have anything else. No, I think that's, I haven't been collected that long. So, but over time, you can look and see how your system is is functioning and behaving. But, uh, you turn that on here, and you can tell it to collect the metrics. You It probably will prompt you to install some software. Uh, it does need a few services to be installed in order to do that. Uh, you can export this data to the network if you want to give it to you know another site for collection. But you can read more about it here. Uh, and it'll take you to the documentation on PCP metrics. So yeah, it tells you about which how it collects them and what utilities it does. This is the service you have to install to get it to actually record the, the PM logger. So that's all I had for today on Rocky Linux. It's a, a, a lot of the bumps that I saw are on the release candidate, and there wasn't that many, there was just a few. Uh, it seemed to be ironed out. It seems to be very smooth and it runs very nicely. Uh, I will publish a benchmark for this. I'm working on benchmarks for all the systems. And I have benchmarked it on one of the other systems that I have set up. So, yeah, and I'll be publishing those mm, probably fairly soon. Um, but, I, yeah, I, I don't know when that's going to be. I'll probably be sometime after the holidays. So, Hope you enjoyed this look at Rocky Linux 8.5. And if you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again very soon. Bye for now.